welcome again to our webinar. My name is Heba Gabriel, and I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, today we have a very special webinar. We will be speaking about flexibility to the grids and all the innovations around it. We will have a very, very um, special guest speakers as well, representing experts, advisors, and leaders in the energy segment in the MENA region. Just before we start, please let me introduce you a few housekeeping rules that uh, all the attendees are on listening only mode and only presenters can speak. But we uh, really um, encourage you to type all your questions in the chat box and I will make sure to address it during the Q&A sessions to the speakers. So let's welcome our four speakers for today. We have with us Abilash Iti Nair, Head of Solar, Smart Buildings and Smart Mobility at Anabuda Group at the UEE. We have Ali Habib, his innovation and sustainable energy expert and advisor. He's formerly at Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in Egypt. We have Daniel Zivitz, from a CEO of Enerware at UEE. And we have Mark Helter, he's a Disruptive Innovation Director from Hager Group Auberny in France. Last but not least, today we have Johannes Tommy, VP Sales and Marketing Region at the Hager Group for Armenia Region. And today he's going to be the moderator of our discussion. So please, Johannes, uh, take over from me and the floor is yours now for the discussion to start. Thank you. Thank you, Heba. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all doing well. As mentioned, my name is Johannes Tome, and I'm in charge of the sales region Armeniad of Haker Group, and I'm located in Dubai. I feel pleased and honored to moderate this webinar today because of the high-class guest speaker and audience. So why does it make sense to talk about flexibility to the grid? Wouldn't it be more easy to have a stable, safe power supply wherever we are? So why flexibility? Um, I want to look back uh, to some events from the past. And I start in 1973, where we had the first oil crisis. We learned that foresight resources are limited and they become more expensive in the future. So we started to innovate and develop uh, other cars more efficient with less fuel consumption. Then we had 1986, this Chernobyl disaster where the nuclear power plant explodes. And we learned that this kind of safe power supply was not really safe. Many people died and they had to uh, innovate some other options to generate power in the grid with gas and maybe wind power. So this was maybe the birth date of renewable energy in a bigger and uh, broader way. Then I remember the pictures of 2012 from Beijing and New Delhi and Mexico City, where you couldn't see the sun for weeks. We had an air pollution and the cities announced hundreds of dead people killed by this air pollution. So it was clear that we cannot continue to have public or private transportation systems consuming oil uh, and polluting the air. So it was also the kickoff of better and more safe and clean options to travel from one place to the other. So you see, flexibility in principle is a must. It's always given. And I think it's very important to have this kind of flexibility to have a better life in the future and to save the environment for our kids. So this is my perspective. What is the perspective of my guest speaker, Daniel? How do you see flexibility to the grids? 
Yeah, flexibility is important. And I have a very specific perspective on flexibility in, in electricity grids. Um, because I run Anaware, and Anaware is a mini grid operator. We are a distributed utility company, and we currently run um, a little over 30 individual grids, most of which are uh, small in the grand scheme of things. They serve commercial and industrial loads, anything from uh, hospitality, five star island hotels, to construction sites, to uh, mines, quarries, um, uh, sales centers, uh, other buildings. And in those grids, we have to deal with energy demands that are very, very spiky because an individual user can switch on a big load or switch it off and uh, uh, that is not averaged out over a large number of users. And to make things easier, we also um, added a lot of renewables. In fact, on many of our sites, we're probably five or 10 years ahead of the grid in this region. So we have up to 95% of renewable energy on the grid during the day without storage. So that means that we have to contend with the fact that the sun might get obscured by a cloud and I might lose 80% of my generation in 30 seconds. Um, this actually happens uh, less so in summer, but certainly in winter when, when the loads are lower and we have the highest renewables shares. And for us, flexibility, both on the generation side and on the demand side, is, is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Without flexibility, we would very regularly drop our loads um, and, and then have uh, to contend with very, very angry clients. Um, but by relying on very flexible generation sources and increasingly on flexible loads, uh, we're able to provide reliable power 24 seven in a state that many utilities in this region today and many experts uh, still claim is not possible, namely with the renewable penetration of 80, 90% versus the 20 or 30% that people uh, contend is, is, uh, is safe. Um, again, all of these figures are without storage. With a lot of storage, it's obviously uh, possible to get to much higher uh, shares and we'll talk about that later. But so my perspective is one of an operator of somebody who promises reliable utilities uh, to organizations that are willing to pay for that. And, uh, and for that business, uh, flexibility is a must. Thank you. And it looks really clear now that this is a different perspective uh, than the consumer side. Uh, Mark, do you have a same idea or what is your opinion about that? Uh, good morning. So I work at Hager, who is a technology provider, a solution enabler. Uh, what we see, as you mentioned, uh, uh, coal is, uh, has a lot of pollution and CO2 issue. Nuclear power plants are, I think, expensive and a lot of people, the acceptance of this technology is not very high. Uh, it's okay, but not in my backyard. And we see also from a cost point of view, uh, the renewables are becoming cheaper and cheaper per, per kilowatt hour. The, the main problem with the renewables, renewable uh, en energy sorry, is that you cannot control them. And therefore, if you want to introduce a large amount of uh, renewable energies in your grids, you need flexibility also on the consumer side. And uh, we'll see this later in the discussion. But I think uh, increasing renewables means also increasing flexibility on the consumer side. So this is more the production side you're talking about. Uh, Ali, do you share that as well? Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Habib, I'm an energy expert. First, I want to thank uh, Daniel and Mark for their uh, insights. And yes, I agree totally with Mark and Daniel. I will try to give regional perspective since we are talking about MENA region. Uh, Arab countries have set an ambitious renewable energy targets. For example, Morocco want to achieve 52% uh, of renewable in 2030. United Arab Emirates 44% by 2050, Egypt 42%, uh, Saudi Arabia 30%, and, and if I talk about capacity, Saudi Arabia want to have 58 gigawatt of renewable, Egypt 54 gigawatt, which is a huge amount of renewable. That's first, we have an ambitious target for renewable. Second thing, we are now uh, experiencing what is called energy, energy transition or energy vendor. And energy transition have like, if we want to like 
uh, describe them briefly, they have, we can use acronym 3DER, uh, 3DER, which is decarbonization, decentralization, digitalization, electrification, and resilience. And for resilience, we need flexibility. And flexibility mainly comes from four main sources, interconnection between countries, demand response, storage, and flexible generation. I want to end my, my, my comments by something also. Even when we are using base load sources, we need flexibility. For example, let's, let's take France as an example. Uh, electricity from France, around 75% of electricity uh, come from nuclear power plants. So what happened at night? Of course, consumption reduced greatly and nuclear power plant is not type that you will switch off at night and switch on uh, on morning. So, and you can't reduce uh, electricity coming out, production coming out from renewable to a certain extent because you are obliged to follow minimum level of uh, production. So what's happened, France export electricity to Switzerland, Switzerland uses electricity in bomb hydro storage, and in the morning they sell it to Italy. By the way, France is the largest electricity exporter in uh, exporter in uh, in, in uh, EU. So even with this load, we need flexibility. But of course, with much higher renewable potential, we need more flexibility. Thanks for you. Thank you. So we also covered now the utility utility perspective. Um, Abilash, it's you not to give your perspective on that. Abilash, I think we cannot hear you at the moment. I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, perfect, thank you. Good, yeah, okay. thank you, Johan, for the, uh, you know, so in fact, I agree with all the three perspectives of things. But, you know, so what I see, you know, see al Buddha being a 60 year old uh, company, you know, which focuses more on things starting from the consumers all the way up to uh, the complete supply chain of things. So the perspective here is that uh, there are two things we are looking at. One is the generation of the power and the other one is the consumption of the power, right? The everything in between is what we call as flexibility. So there are two parts to it. One is of course the technology that goes into these specific applications. You know, that could be nuclear, that could be a combination of uh, multiple generations. It could be the type of, uh, you know, technology that we have at the LVHV and of course the higher uh, transmission system as well. But when you look at it from the energy side, you know, so ultimately what do we do this? We do it to make sure that we generate adequate energy and consume an equally adequate amount of energy so that we don't have much of losses. So the perspective here is to have something in between a, a system which is unique to its own application. So uh, something like a microgrid uh, or something like a smart grid, you know, that can actually integrate with both would be a better uh, uh, objective specific to those applications. Uh, if uh, you talk about country to country transfer, you know, these kind of large grids uh, usually have those buying and selling power kind of content, the PPA models you know, already in place. But what about the consumer? The consumer usually gets uh, paid and uh, you know his consumption is based on what he uses. So as we see more uh, renewable penetration, there is also a need for a permanent source to actually be the base load for all these applications. So nuclear, uh, I feel, plays that part. And of course, integration and management at even the technology level is going to help us determine this. So how do we do that? It happens in two ways. One is, of course, called the generation at the point of consumption. And the other one is called consumption at the point of generation. So these are two concepts I feel, uh, you know, will actually add more value to how if even nuclear, you know, which is not being seen in a very uh, positive sense these days, you know, can add uh, more value to our consumer requirements. Okay, this was now a very general statement about the perspective on flexibility. Maybe we can become more concrete. So I would like to go for uh, some special details, uh, which is about the adoption of grid flexibility contributors in the MENA region. Uh, and the question, is this growing? So maybe I can ask you, Ali, uh, if you have a special detail about e-mobility, which can contribute to this uh, point of view. Thank you, Johannes. Yes, uh, it's growing. 
uh, we have seen lately some projects, uh, immobility and other projects, for example, uh, League of Arab States now are working on interconnection line between countries, which will increase flexibility. For immobility, I think the leader in this area is uh, United Arab of Emirates. It's the only country that has mandate. And other countries are moving on. Uh, I like the example of Jordan because uh, Jordan, adoption of electric mobility there is uh, uh, came from uh, economics because it's, it's, it's really the economic choice there. So people there in Jordan, they buy secondhand uh, uh, electric vehicles and they even some, some user, they manufacture their, their uh, charging box themselves and they let the other user use their uh, charging box. So it's uh, really impressive uh, in, uh, in Jordan. And uh, in the vision of Jordan, it, uh, 2025 vision, they want to install 3000 charging station. Also, we have seen like baby steps in Egypt and in Morocco, both are searching for opportunities to manufacture electric vehicle. And uh, also others, countries in Gulf area are now getting adopted and setting plans for adopting e-mobility. Thank you. Um, when I remember well, Daniel, you were talking about some issues with storage uh, systems. Uh, can you give more details about that no? and the impact on the current uh, grid flexibility? Yeah, sure. I think the first thing to recognize is that when we're talking about renewable energy penetration and storage penetration, uh, at least in the GCC, we're still at the at the very beginning, right? Uh, we keep hearing examples from Europe about nuclear, um, certainly also about renewables, where where France at some point had seventy five percent of its power come from nuclear, and and Germany and Denmark at at certain times of the year run ninety five percent on renewables. The UK as well, but when you come to the Middle East. Um, at least in North Africa region, uh, by and large, we're talking about 95% to 99% gas power. That's the situation today. So, uh, and, and I feel that a lot of the worries that you see here from, from uh, utilities and end users are the same that they were 10 years ago. I arrived in, uh, in the Middle East in 2008 and at all the renewable energy conferences, there was a guy showing a picture of a wind turbine and was like, oh my God, the intermittency, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> well, at the time there was, as far as I can tell, uh, one wind turbine in the entire GCC, namely an 800 kilowatt turbine on Sabanias Island in, in Western Abu Dhabi. Um, and then obviously uh, there are a number of large scale wind projects in, in Egypt in particular, right? There are some smaller ones in Jordan, in, in Oman, but still, when you put all of this together, uh, so far, the intermittency of the renewables has been uh, a non-issue. An, an outage of a large gas turbine has been a much bigger issue than, than any intermittency. Fortunately, in many ways, this is changing, as of course, uh, some countries have made great steps in, in implementing uh, renewables. Jordan is well on their way to hitting daytime peak with, uh, with a solar that's already uh, operating or under construction. Uh, Dubai is going to construct about five gigawatts of solar and, and will thereby hit their winter daytime peak in, in the next three years, I believe. And, the, uh, and Abu Dhabi um, is very ambitiously uh, looking to hit the same milestone probably in the next five years and going, doing that at, at uh, one to two gigawatts per, per procurement round, right? With, with uh, more than that being tendered every year. So I think what you will see is a lot of solar uh, coming online. And the storage and the flexibility problem is then a very specific one, namely how do you manage very, very steep ramp rates in the morning where you have a sudden uh, influx of solar and you have a very steep ramp down rate uh, in the afternoon and that will create what the Californians know as the duck curve. There you have the same thermal uh, demand load uh, profile and then uh, uh, the thermal generation will go close to zero uh, during the day, particularly in winter. And you have to somehow keep uh, the base load, the industrial loads, and the water production running um, when you really have a surplus of power on the grid and, and you don't really want to run any, any gas. And those are the moments when, when flexibility and storage will become truly, uh, uh, truly valuable. The uh, other situations, the nighttime and, and whatever, we really don't have that much uh, inflexible base load generation here. Sure, we're getting a little bit of nuclear again in Abu Dhabi, but but in the grand scheme of things, even with the 
uh, with the grids, with the very limited grids that we have here. Um, it'll be the solar ramp ups and ramp downs that are the, the big issues. And of course, when you have uh, clouds and sandstorms coming through. So Bruce Smith from from uh, EWEC or yeah, ADWEC and now EWEC um, was showing uh, about a year ago some graphs from the Swayhan uh, solar plant in Abu Dhabi, which is a 1.2 gigawatt plant. And uh, with some clouds coming through, they lost 500 megawatts in 30 minutes, right? That's a, that's a fair amount of ramping. Uh, it doesn't happen too often, probably happens only on a few days per year. Um, uh, but that's, that's the flexibility that, that you didn't really require in grids that were dominated by gas that will be very valuable. And, and how you provide that in a market where all utilities are vertically integrated and state-owned um, is, in my guess, will be quite different from the way it has been done in Europe in particular, where you have reasonably deregulated uh, energy markets. And um, I think you'll see a lot more procurement from central authorities than, than the kind of uh, uh, investor-based uh, projects that you've seen in Europe, just because the control of the grid is still so centralized. Um, that's at least my guess, looking at the pilot projects that we've seen so far. Um, not many people know, but Abu Dhabi actually has 650 megawatt hours, 648 megawatt hours of battery storage uh, on the grid um, that the utility bought a few years ago. DY in Dubai um, has uh, about 20 megawatt hours of pilot projects of storage and is building the equivalent of, of 10,000 megawatt hours of thermal storage as part of a, uh, the phase four of the Mohammed bin Rashid solar park. So uh, all of those are utility-owned projects. And the question is, as more solar comes on, will the utilities be able to afford um, the massive investment in storage that, uh, that they'll need if they can't figure out how to get investors on it? So it sounds that in principle, the things are really growing. Uh, now I learned that from you and Ali. Uh, but you're talking a lot about the utilities, which means we have to talk about the smart grid. Uh, Abilash, do you have uh, an idea about that, how it's um, growing as well? Uh, we need your right. microphone. Ah. I got it. <laughs> Once again. Thank you very much, John. So, uh, you know, the adding to what uh, Daniel had to say about storage. So let me think about storage as storage as some kind of a reservoir of energy you know, to be used as and when required, right? So to do to use that, what do we need? So we need uh, two concepts. So one is, of course, the, take, uh, the software logic that usually comes with it. You know, since the, everything that he's been saying, you can't have somebody go in and try to do it manually, right? It needs, it should be software control because it takes time for people to move from place to place. And, you know, it is going to take time. So that's where the development into smart grid comes into picture where the logics can be set way high in might be the control center and you know the storage and the normal operation of the grid can itself leverage this experience because as we know electricity changes on a microsecond basis and of course these softwares uh, or i would should say information technology uh, capabilities should actually uh, improve and that's what's happening here in uh, places like dubai and other places because once the hardware is set you know, the software logics can instruct the hardware to make it happen. So the next stage is where do you think these are useful? You know, so now we are talking about e-mobility as well. So as more electric vehicles come into the picture, that is going to be a steep increase in the amount of load uh, that is mm -hmm. needed to run these vehicles. So in those cases as well, storage plays a very important part because, you know, right now, the only demand that we see is, of course, in buildings and homes and those places. But as charging stations come in and the charging stations do keep increasing in size, so faster charging means more power to be drawn from the grid. And hence, the integration of these devices, of these hardware devices uh, for electric mobility, you know, along with the smart grid capabilities will enable providing that required energy to that specific location where it is needed. So as people keep moving from place to place, the entire demand curve, the load curve is going to change from the grid perspective. And you know, if you have uh, storage in one location, you know, focused for a specific region, uh, it's going to be hard. So that also will move on to a much more flexible model. And it, the, uh, the hundreds or thousands of megawatts that we're talking about will actually move into different pocket locations. In fact, I was uh, you know, uh, involved in one project in Australia where uh, you know a 30 megawatt 
uh, you know, grid was supposed to have uh, some kind of a portable micro grid. So it's a storage come uh, solar, a mix of both, where uh, you know the battery keeps charging from solar, but it's on a trailer, so they could move it from one place to another. You know, so within the uh, entire city, so that you know the peaking, the duck curve peaking that he was talking about, and Mr. Daniel was talking about, can be managed depending on where the peaking occurs. So depending on uh, a 24 hours cycle, or uh, might be a month, 30 day monthly cycle, or even a yearly seasonal cycle. You know, this these type of solutions will help add that flexibility we're talking about, and of course the software and the hardware synchronized together to make it all happen. So this is the this is where the entire industry is heading towards and uh, about five to six years from now you will see solutions coming together into the market you know enabling or with this exact perspective or logic in mind so that's where i see the market going so let's come back directly to daniel because you were talking about these uh, topics like storage uh, what are the roadblocks or the challenges today you know, to continue with this integration? Uh, what is your opinion about that? Daniel? Countries in the region to, for, for individuals or for companies to invest in storage. If you have a tariff that's a block tariff, um, that doesn't include any time of day component, um, then then why then why bother with storage? Even the solar programs in the region are by and large metering programs, which treat the grid as a free resource, where I can produce solar power, I can feed it into the grid, and I can buy back at night for the same for the same tariff. So I think it's the tariff structure, mm -hmm. um, and to a certain extent, that's driven by the owner structure of the of the grid that are the biggest impediment to, uh, to storage rollout. So until the utilities um, make it easier for individuals or investors to build storage or incentivize that, I don't think it's going to happen. And 100% of the procurement will happen by the utilities. Um, that's not to say that you wouldn't see large scale project. As I mentioned previously, Abu Dhabi has 650 megawatts uh, Dubai is including in its solar power plants uh, fair amounts of storage and and as a battery provider. So, uh, right, Enaware last year, in the last 12 months, probably installed 10 megawatt hours of, of storage uh, uh, for some of these utility clients, um, uh, but also for, for off-grid clients. Um, as a battery provider, we see an increasing interest by clients to include storage in their, in their solar projects. But that's typically limited to, to specific situations where, where the grid is weak or unavailable. On the grid, um, it's, a, it's a game that will be decided by the utilities. Um, and, and so far, the volumes have been small, right? I think they've been a, there's been a tender in Jordan. Um, I haven't seen anything from, from Egypt, really. I've seen something from South Sudan. Uh, I've certainly seen multiple procurements from, uh, from Somaliland. So it's the places with the weak grids where the benefit is the highest and where utility companies, uh, donors, uh, and financiers are going after this hard. The GCC uh, core grids are reasonably robust and, and very centralized. So uh, most policymakers and utility executives tend to think more in terms of uh, large power lines, uh, for example, the, the connection between Egypt and, and uh, Saudi that's been in the works for a while. Um, but not so much in storage yet. It's still considered very expensive. Johannes, are you still around or did we lose you? I think the next speaker was Ali. Yeah. Can hear you uh -huh. again? Yeah, yes, so we, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, interesting to uh, see your perspective. Ali, do you have some complementary roadblocks in mind? Uh, yes. Uh, first, thanks, Daniel, for your comments. It's I totally agree with you. Uh, second roadblocks, I think till now we don't have high penetration in, uh, in, in the grid in the area. For example, largest penetration is in uh, Jordan and in Morocco. It's around 13.5%. So mismatch between supply and demand can be accommodated with usual methods like primary reserve and secondary reserve. 
That's the first thing. Second thing, after, like Daniel said, but second one is the cost. Uh, Gulf countries ha have the ability to finance their project, but in countries, other countries, they don't have ability to finance this. And by the way, Egypt is considering uh, a bombed hydrogen storage uh, power plant. It's, it's, it's very big. It's, uh, it's the same capacity like high dam. It's 2.2 gigawatts. But now we're still searching for finance. So we need new business model partnership, PPP, public uh, private partnership, to let these projects like take off and start it in the area. Thank you, which also means, Mark, you have uh, maybe some additional ideas about roadblocks or how to speed up the integration yep. of new systems? I, I, I'm in line with Daniel about tariffs. I think the tariff structure is very important. Uh, also, the price level of electricity. Uh, I'll give you just an example. In Germany, uh, electricity is one of the most expensive in Europe. It's 30 cents, euro cents per kilowatt hour. And when you have this level of uh, uh, electricity price, it makes possible to introduce new new technologies. You get a payback, a reasonable payback for these uh, solutions. So when electricity price is very low, why should I invest in in uh, expensive technologies? Yeah? Uh, I think the other things are, um, and you see in, in Germany, uh, storage, for example, in the residential area be behind the meter, uh, today, uh, 200,000 systems have been sold. Um, so this shows that when electricity is high, when there are incentives, it, it works and we, we can deploy these solutions. The other thing is the, you have to make these smart grids, you need communication between all the systems, all the buildings and the grids. This has a cost, of course, and uh, as long as there is no business model behind this that uh, uh, pushes uh, companies or people to invest, nothing will happen. So today, for example, for the uh, dynamic tariffs could be an answer also. That means uh, in some sometimes you get money when you when you send energy in the grid, or you can get very low priced energy from the grid. For example, at noon when there is overproduction of PV, and uh, in the evening at seven o'clock when when everyone has uh, needs energy, it can be more expensive. So if we create this this system with uh, dynamic tariffs, could be a tool for this. Uh, then we create also a payback for these investments and we people understand why they should invest in these technologies so high cost can be on one side a showstopper but on the other side a push element for more innovation and finding better solutions now, abilash can you uh, contribute to that as well right I mean, uh, I mean again i agree with all of them you know but at the same time you know as we are talking about a little bit of e-mobility as well you know, see, the rest of the world is catching up or is actually leading e-mobility uh, from a point of view. But in uh, GCC, I think UAE is a very good place to bring in these technologies and that add more value to the grid flexibility that we are talking about. But in that case, what happens is, uh, you know, currently any electric vehicle charging is considered free, right? So when we uh, propose things for free, right, as he as uh, uh, the other speaker said, you know, so it doesn't give an incentive for other companies to get in and try to bring in good technology to invest. So just this is just one example in one uh, uh, one type of technology that uh, adds value to grid flexibility. On the other hand, there is a lot of investment into software, you know, uh, smart grid and uh, smart grid applications. But what I've noticed is uh, the concept of smart grid changes from place to place. And even for that, if we don't have a conceptualized model, you know, which is focused on might be one part of the grid flexibility. An example would be, let's say, uh, capacity utilization. If there is an incentive for higher capacity utilization, you would see more renewable energy. So I was uh, uh, seeing a question uh, in one of the Q&A, uh, in our Q&A, which says that which type of renewable energy is better? You know, so that's, a hard question to answer. So this is the same question that any consumer would like to know. You know, if I want to go with renewable energy for my campuses, 
you know, should I go with solar? Should I go with wind? Or should I go with any other type of solution? So my, my answer to this is if there is an incentive on the amount of energy generated and utilized at the same time, uh, you know, it would be great. So irrespective of what type of energy that you generate, everything's electrons, everything's electricity. So ultimately for the grid to be flexible, you know, these needs to be identified and an application based uh, tariff structure would really help in actually propagating. That includes the time of day, depending on when you are uh, utilizing that energy. It could also include uh, your investment, your conversion rate. If you are generating one kilowatt, then are you using exactly one kilowatt or might be less than that? So that gives an incentive on increasing the efficiency of the system as well. So as these all these come together, I think uh, it will be a challenge. So I mean, it will be a uh, positive. So at this point, at every stages of technology, innovation, concept that I've, I've been speaking about, challenges are there everywhere, you know? So uh, there needs to be a discussion on these topics individually. So not just the high price, high rollers kind of a game is what I feel. Okay. So it looks that innovation is really key and it's going on. Uh, so maybe Mark, I would like to ask you a question. What kind of innovation will bring over the next few years for the grid flexibility? Um, or maybe to change the question, uh, what uh, will be the grid of tomorrow? Yes, um, so if you want to introduce flexibility on loads, for example, uh, you have not, uh, it doesn't make sense to work on lighting systems because today most of the lighting system use LEDs for very low consumption. Mm -hmm. So the big consumer are still HVAC, uh, whether heating or cooling. Uh, electrical vehicle will be a big consumer in the future, not yet, but it's starting. And we, we know that there are big plans in the next coming years. I think uh, immobility will have a bigger and bigger importance. And of course, storage. And storage can be uh, stationary in buildings or behind the meter. And uh, But all these cars arriving will will are able to offer services to the grid also. We can use, when you have a car, first generation of electric cars were able to drive 100, 150 kilometers. Now all cars drive 300, 400, even more. That means that we go from battery size from 20 kilowatt hours to, to 60, 80, even 100 kilowatt hours. And you don't drive every day 500 kilometers or 400 kilometers. So that means that a part of your car storage capacity can be used to provide services to the grid. And that's called uh, V2, V2X, V2 grid or V2 home, vehicle to home, vehicle to grid. And this technology we are working on also, uh, this will appear in the market in the next three years. You know? So this is one way to provide flexibility to the grid. Of course, what I mentioned before, the stationary storage systems, 200,000 in Germany, this can also be used, for example, in combination with dynamic tariffs. Uh, this uh, battery system, storage system, can uh, provide uh, services to the grid. Yeah? Uh, we, know, we know also that the future will be electric and in Europe all the, all the internal combustion uh, heating system will disappear in 2030. That means that will be, they will become electric and heating system have a big inertia. You can stop a heating system, you can restart it, same for cooling, you have inertia. And uh, this means, inertia means also flexibility. So if you have a communication system uh, and the grid, grid tells the building, no, I, I would need some uh, kilowatt, uh, the, the building can say, okay, I give you some kilowatts, I, I can stop my heating system, I can stop my cooling system, I can, uh, I have, a lot of energy in my battery, I can send it to you. I can stop the charging of my electric car or I can empty the battery of my electric car. So this will be the future. That means from passive buildings uh, that are just consuming, we will have active buildings that are contributing to the grid. That means also, of course, uh, I think uh, uh, Abilash mentioned it, a lot of software and a lot of communication behind to make this uh, arrive. We need also the communication protocols, but there are some solutions. For example, for electric cars, there is ISO 15118. Uh, it's very technical, but this, this will enable uh, cars to, 
to uh, discharge their battery in, in, uh, in the grid or in buildings. Yeah. So we see also uh, around the pure technologies, we the communication protocols and the software technologies are also coming and uh, more and more. Johannes? Sorry, I was just uh, disconnected. Uh, so what I learned, uh, it's storage, better, controlled, using software, becoming smart. Ali, do you share this idea and opinion or do you have some additional comments on that? No, I totally agree with Mark. Thanks, Mark, for your excellent comments. I will try to give like overview on top of this. Currently, we are living in what's called industry uh, Industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0. We have same paradigm in energy. We have what's called energy vendor eins, energy vendor zwei, energy vendor drei. Or in English, sorry, I said it in, in German because they are leader in this. What's sometimes it's called grid one, grid two, grid three, and in some literature it's called smart grid one and smart grid two. Okay, grid one or energy vendor eins is the, the normal paradigm, which is unidirectional flow from production to cons consumption. Uh, grid two or smart grid one, it's partially autonomous with high penetration of energy, uh, of renewable energy and flexibility. It's partially autonomous. Smart grid two, it will be fully autonomous. Let me give an example uh, for fully autonomous. I want to like mention a project called Brooklyn Microgrid. What is this? It's like neighborhood when people install uh, PV plants on, uh, on the rooftop and they use blockchain uh, for their platform. And first thing, they use peer-to-peer -peer transaction. So you can use a mobile phone, your, your phone, it's a normal app. You can set when to sell, when to buy, amount of selling, amount of buy, uh, the price, everything. And it's once the condition or met transaction will, uh, will will be done immediately it's called smart contracting which is another layer built on blockchain and besides this e-mobility now is is getting in this area where e-mobility will play a crucial role in crucial role in uh, great flexibility by acting as demand response acting as storage even acting as a flexible generation using like for example fuel cell uh, electric vehicle, where you will fuel, you will put some hydrogen in your tank, it will produce electricity and this electricity can be transported to the grid because we are using only our cars only 5% of time and 95% is parking. So it's huge, huge potential we can use from e-mobility. Okay, so um, we are talking about a lot of um, energy vendor, energy transition, yeah. one to four. Uh, I think it's directly linked to Daniel and your point of view. Uh, is there something additional now on uh, energy transition for for you? Yeah, I sometimes wonder if, I mean, it's easy to get overexcited about technology, right? Whether that's blockchain or the next better solar cell or whatever. If you if you take a look at the bigger picture, it is perfectly possible to get to very high renewable energy shares in the Middle East during the day. 100% renewable energy is possible with today's technology and at costs that are the same or lower than what today's energy costs. It is more about the right planning, implementation, uh, structuring and financing solutions, um, which are driven by, by policy making. Um, when you look at getting to 100% renewable energy systems, Technology-wise, again, that is possible today, and Egypt is a great example because Egypt used to be powered 100% by renewable energy from the from the Aswan High Dam. Um, obviously, you can't build too many of those, or if you do, then you get into arguments with who owns that river, um, uh, right? So uh, there isn't. It's 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 not easy to create more storage from nothing, but but I don't think you need to wait for blockchain and and peer-to-peer -peer energy trading to transition to a renewable energy system. Um, people started uh, much of the electrical system uh, with renewables and, and our technology today is good enough. Um, I think the bigger issues are still on the policy side, right? How do you enable long-term planning 
um, that is consistent and that drives down the cost of capital, which are the key drivers of, uh, of, the, of the cost of many of these solutions. Um, and, and how do you share um, the, the cost between the users in a way that is fair and equitable and perceived as so? Uh, one of the reasons why several European com countries, notably Germany, have been able to drive uh, the energy transition forward is that they got political buy-in, um, uh, notably from large shares of voters who seem to be willing to pay more than double the cost, uh, than, than, uh, sorry, a price for electricity that is more than double what the actual cost is. If you, if you take a look at the average residential electricity bill, um, it's, it's eye-watering on the cost per kilowatt hour uh, side, right? It's double or triple um, what you would pay here in the Middle East, and yet people are happily uh, voting um, for that to continue uh, and to drive that energy transition forward. And I don't think we have the same kind of buy-in in the Middle East as of yet. And that's a, and that again has to do with the fact that that fewer people are involved in it. Right? There's less democratic feedback, um, and there's less ownership because all the assets are owned. Uh, by the utilities themselves or by very large scale uh, investment vehicles. Um, so, so how do you drive this kind of uh, broader based transition that goes just beyond a few uh, straight regulators and utilities who, in my experience, on average, tend to be more familiar and much more comfortable with large steam turbines? Right? I think I think a lot of the push in in North America and in Europe has come from from people who wanted more and believe that it could be done, and has been resisted by the utility industry. Um, uh, most notably, people already running large coal turbines. Um, uh, uh, right? There, there, there is it's it's more than a technical problem. It, it, it's an awareness problem to a certain extent, um, and it's a it's a regulatory problem, but it's certainly not a, a technical problem. And that's that's really the question. How do you drive that? I, I don't know. But there's a there's an opportunity there to accelerate things for sure. So, Abilash, how do you see the grid of tomorrow? And there was one question about hydrogen power. Is it one part of the future? Right. I mean, it's a I mean, having hydrogen into the mix is, is a controversial discussion even today. But you know, as a fuel, you know, it's not deferred at this point, mainly because of the infrastructure needed to handle it. It's quite expensive, but that is another option or a discussion that's going on because hydrogen fuel cells are a type of storage. You know, when uh, if they are more cost effective in terms of the storage within a vehicle, they will be considered as another type of storage and handled within the vehicle. So depending on how long your drive is, you can just fill up the amount of hydrogen in your vehicle and Along the way, you have electric vehicle chargers that you can charge, top up, and you can completely replace your uh, vehicle in that sense. So these are concepts that are still developing. You know, once we see the uh, vehicle itself or the uh, powertrain of the vehicle, which is electric itself, you know, uh, either you convert it from hydrogen, you convert it from other chemicals, you know, it's going to be the same. So people are, uh, there are discussions in that manner. But of course, there is uh, uh, another question about the charging right so in future what we see is because uh, i mean as uh, uh, i would say mark was mentioning there are different ways to handle that so in the future is going to be like uh, v2g v2 uh, i mean v2x is the best option as you said but uh, for now we are in the v1g uh, scenario where let's say you have two large vehicles or large capacity vehicles charging at maximum capacity at the same time from uh, the same uh, building, right? So in that case, what to do? You know, in that case, uh, that could be some kind of a peaking charge, which is being implemented in different parts of the world. You have in California, they have something called a peak tariff, even based on the time of day and the time of peak that is expected in that building. So traditionally, we are all used to having our electricity bills in two ways. One is based on the maximum power drawn at any point of time. You get billed based on that. And then, of course, the amount of energy that you draw. So you get billed based on this. But when two vehicles are charging at the same time, uh, now the charges themselves that are coming up, right? So the charges themselves, I mean, especially the fast chargers, which needs large amount of power, you know, so they usually have what we call as a dynamic charging mode. So what happens is when two vehicles are charging 
at their maximum capacities, let's say 50 kilowatt each. So you need 100 kilowatt from the load or from the grid, right? So in that case, if 100 kilowatt is not available, uh, based on the feedback system, the charger will control the amount of power up to the adequate capacity. So for this, what you need? So you need the system to be as uh, non-turbulent as possible. So usually unity power factor systems are looked at. So you you know, if if anybody is interested in electricity, go into your substation and try to uh, you know press all those squeaky buttons on the energy meter. You know, you will see a setting called a power factor, right? So it is actually about of how much it is a comparison of how much you can use uh, in real time and how much the grid can give you, right? So if it is the closer it is to one, the more efficient the system. So as new technologies come in, you know, you will see that the power factor of these systems move closer to unity. Because uh, if you see older buildings, what we've seen is if when I do the feasibility study in older buildings, you know, they in UAE, they are set to 0.8, which is actually quite fluctuating and quite troubling for any system to be installed there because the more the fluctuations, the more the stress and strain on the system. And of course, the lifetime goes down. So the discussions are such that if, let's say, your entire system becomes unity grid or a unity power factor system or a unity power factor based power system, you know, then you are, uh, you know, there are a lot of advantages to the grid. So this is a core focus when you bring in electric mobility into the mixture, because your chargers are typically designed to work in that manner, because that is literally no feedback. Because one, when you're converting from AC to DC and then giving it to the battery. It is more or less a very uh, you know flat curve. You know, there is no turbulation on that. And of course, because of this, what happens is the V2G concept adds more value. So think of it this way: the future grid is going to be in two parts. One is, uh, let's say, before the utility meter, which is your home, your building, or whatever. Anything that you generate in that building or uh, let's say object, you can you could have uh, multiple sources. You could have uh, solar on the roof. You could have a windmill, you know, right in between the building. You could even have mini turbines in your ventilator units, you know, which can also provide energy. So depending on whatever be the type of energy, you know, it can be accumulated onto a pool and they can balance amongst each other to provide that power to that building, home or anything. There are technologies available in the market to do that. So that's where I think Daniel, uh, uh, I mean, that adds more weight to what Daniel said that even today technology is so ahead that you can have 100 percent renewable energy being used for all these cases put together so it just depends on how you do the calculation and how you connect the system not looking at one type of system per se but on the other side outside the utility you know because you are affected by your neighbors you are affected by uh, what is the power that's coming from the grid so energy storage uh, adds that other perspective of the grid so uh, when a consumer starts using energy, the information again goes back onto the smart grid, you know, and the smart grid does all that logic. So there are terms like uh, virtual uh, power plant and all that, you know, where the software decides, okay, what is the most optimum, uh, you know, power flow that needs to be to that specific consumer and all the hardware in that uh, chain or that stream, you know, triggers those changes, you know, might be, it could be a little bit of power for here and there, you know, it could be dynamic variations. So ultimately the entire system works as a single power system and, you know, the power. So this is the future that is expected and it's not going to happen now, you know, as diverse as we are, but going forward, all these connected systems with the help of the smart grid as logic will make unity power factor a concept for the future, hence making energy more efficient. Yeah, so all these plays an important factor. So independently, they are happening, but uh, future is going to be much brighter you know, when if they all come together. So there is one remaining question, and I can stay with you. Um, how to speed up these kind of technologies? And maybe you can concentrate on smart grid and e-mobility, and maybe not more than two minutes as we want to uh, take the questions of our participants. All right. Um, Okay, so of course, uh, you know, as I told you, see, uh, right now the technologies are all developing, but uh, they have reached a stage where uh, I think the government needs to, uh, you know, look at certain pilots here and there, not just looking at e-mobility or renewables 
as a single entity, but looking at you know enabling the energy in specific locations. So I was talking about application-based charging, right? So generation at the point of consumption or consumption at the point of generation. So these are two different logics. I think there needs to be independent, uh, you know, push, you know, maybe uh, somewhat of a pilot, which is already being done. But at the same time, the, the intent behind those, you know, have to be focused on a much higher intent, you know, on the future grid or the flexibility of the grid itself. So currently, e-mobility uh, pilots are happening separately. Uh, we have grid uh, pilots happening separately. We have energy storage pilots happening separately. But if, let's say, the government comes and says, okay, I dedicate, might be an area to be as net zero energy kind of a region, you know, then uh, others can bring in these technologies, you know, and then, of course, the regulations also have to uh, add that into the mix. And you know, once this kind of a regulation focused on uh, utilizing green energy with net zero uh, being one of them. So, so that is transition from a regular system to a green building, then net zero, then being an exporter and whatnot. So in that, when that transition happens, you know, along with the regulation supporting them, uh, and of course, the support from the government initially, you know, it's going to add these new energy trends. So the, also along with that, there's also a change that you will see in the behavior of utilization of energy. So people will start thinking about, uh, you know, how do I consume the energy? Just like right now, uh, we think about fuel, right? So if you want to travel a thousand kilometers, we need to plan our route. So similarly, this planning of energy needs to be in, in place. So that's a behavioral uh, issue, but the technology at this point, definitely can make it happen and that and these steps does start from the regulatory body and the uh, uh, implementers at this point I would say. okay thank you Abhinash so let's stay with e-mobility and Ali you're an expert on that as well so what how do you think that we can speed up this introduction uh first thing policy second thing policy third thing policy using policy you can encourage some behavior some technology and you can discourage it that's the first thing. It's it's the base. You can do you can do anything without the right policy. Second thing for e mobility, especially, we want behavior change, mindset change, especially in our area. For example, I, I remember the result of survey about people why you don't like e uh, electric vehicle or you adopt electric vehicle, uh, and astonishingly, most of result came about very 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 small thing. I don't like it sounds because it's not has you know, the, the sound of the car, the rear sound of the engine. So we need behavior change and also charging. We need to foster charging. People are getting bored easily. So, and I, I would like to have an example by mobile phone. In the past, we used all of us, I think we have Nokia phone, which you can charge it once a week or twice a week. And sometimes you lose your charger because you don't use it that much. But currently we charge our phone for like two or three times per day because we realized the benefits of smartphone. We, you can do all of your works using smartphone. So we need policy and we need behavior to change and to change mindset of the consumer. Okay, thank you. So as we are coming close to the end, um, I would really suggest to extend the webinar for another 10 minutes that we can answer the remaining questions. Uh, before we come to that, I would like to ask Daniel about the storage, because this seems to be one of the most important parts. So how you believe we can speed up uh, the use and the installation of storage systems uh, in the grid? Well, the grid part is the hard part. I was just going to say, if you want to accelerate it in the region, I would start deploying storage where it can save, uh, where it can save money today, and that is in off-grid situations. And what I mean by that is that uh, the Middle East uh, has about 10 gigawatts of diesel power generation, uh, primarily for construction, for islands, uh, quarries, uh, security applications, and maybe most importantly in the oil and gas industry. And in those industries, when you talk about off-grid temporary power generation, you have, uh, you're running diesel generators, which have a cost that is typically two to three times more than grid electricity. Hence, all the economic questions that we discussed that that would encourage storage will hit the off-grid sector first long before they come to the grid right that's typically the market that that we serve as anywhere and that's why we have been actively pushing 
uh, storage, and they have been deploying storage since 2017, uh, modern storage, not lead acid, but, but lithium ion, right? And that's where the economics by and large makes sense today, because you can, you can replace expensive diesel fuel with solar, in some cases with wind, and it makes sense to at least uh, use storage to stabilize the grid to get to 100% daytime solar energy, um, uh, even if maybe the economics for, for nighttime storage are not there. So I think if you if you go after that sector and you go after it hard, um, then there is a, a demonstration effect, right? You will see a supply chain build up. You will see uh, uh, users become more fam familiar with uh, this kind of technology and hopefully a spillover uh, to more demonstration projects that are grid connected. And and if, if for example, you install a battery uh, uh, storage system and a solar system on a site that ultimately does get a grid connection, then I think that will push the utility to deal with the question of how can we utilize uh, these systems. And it's not a hopeless game. Uh, several utilities in the region, including Diwa in Dubai, um, are planning smart grid projects or rather mini grid projects that can connect or disconnect from the grid. And, and I think that in the end will be a cheaper way of, of providing grid flexibility and grid reliability than just overbuilding centralized uh, infrastructure in a, in, a, in a grid that has very, very strong peaks. So, uh, yeah, the grid part, in my view, will come second. We'll start in the off-grid, in the temporary power market that is today diesel generated, but where the economics are really, really good for, for solar diesel or solar battery combinations. Thank you. So how is it in Europe, Mark? Um, are there similar situations? Is there another possibility to speed it up? Yes, uh, there are the main levels are policy. Here I agree with Ali. Uh, incentives is another way to do things. And of course, there are also companies that are willing to, it's part of their strategy, to become CO2 neutral or, or uh, reach ener energy autarky. Same for citizens. And I would like to mention the, the example of Calif California has a very has very strong policies and uh, we, could, we could think that this is a lot of constraints, but in fact, they create uh, champions, uh, technology champions by doing this, by forcing themselves to, to push these new energies, they, they get benefits out of this. So uh, in Europe, some examples about policy uh, in some regions, it's mandatory for every new building to put uh, solar uh, production on the roof. Uh, it's uh, mandatory to have a charging station in each gasoline uh, gas station to have at least one uh, electric charging station. So this is uh, pushed by governments. Uh, we can also pull by uh, giving incentives. Incentives are you get money when you install a stationary storage, for example, in Germany. You can have uh, tax advantages when you produce energy, when you sell this energy. So these are uh, this kind of levers are, are used in Europe to push these technologies. Thank you. And looking on the clock, it's really running so fast. Uh, time to say thank you very much no, for all your comments and contribution. Uh, what now we expected, I think, is uh, fulfilled. Nevertheless, there are so many open questions now. So I would like to ask Heber to take over no, and maybe to distribute some of the questions to some of us uh, to answer them in a hopefully very quick way. And uh, maybe we can also agree on uh, answering some of the questions after the webinar as we cannot fix uh, all the questions uh, during the coming 10 minutes. Eva, can you take over? Hello, thank you, Johannes. So we have a first question from Epsihal asking about uh, will the gas plants phase out as the renewable penetration increases or will they be used for flexibility? Or are there plans for, uh, to encourage demand response to align demand with renewable supply? Should we expect smart meters and economics uh, initiatives sometime soon? Who would like to take this question? Uh, Avilash, do you want to answer on that? Yeah, I can also, yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, I do feel that you know gas plants will phase out eventually. You know, but uh, not anytime soon because you know most of our loads over here are based on gas plants. So it's not going to be. Uh, I mean, I would say it's it's not going to be a smooth transition if you ask me. 
because you know the uh, system the energy system is already set to these gas plants right so when you in incorporate flexibility into the entire system you know there is a bit of pushback initially that's what we are seeing right now but going forward you know the looking at the economics of it uh, renewable penetration is increasing and you know uh, seems like we have moved past um, you know at least 25% of that push but that is still going to be uh, a major economic uh, pushback from the already existing systems so nobody uh, likes to change right overnight and this is a disruptive technology and it will take some time to actually come up but it's definitely going to happen and the grid flexibility will be the short term goal for these uh, gas power plants you know as they move from a primary type of source onto a secondary type of source you know you will see these gas plants being used as uh, mitigation machines you know like peaking systems you know so uh, just like how you have regenerative braking in your cars right so when you take your foot off your gas what happens so that is some energy generated and it goes back into uh, regenerative braking i mean regenerative braking that's hybrids at this point but the electric vehicles do have them the, these gas plants will act like that and uh, you know some kind of a flywheel based storage for interim storage requirements so that's what we are uh, seeing the market uh, moving into in the shorter sense and of course uh, the smart meters and economic incentives uh, you know are one of the ways to make that happen right okay. because uh, all that hope that answers the question Thank you. Thank you, Abilash. And now another question from Mohammed. What is the best renewable energy for now and why? Mark, you want to answer on that? Yes, I can answer this. Uh, I think solar is, uh, is one of the best. Uh, maybe wind, offshore wind also. Of course, hydraulic when it's existing is, is uh, also an excellent one. I think the big advantage of, uh, of PV it's a static technology that means in terms of maintenance, of course, in depending on the countries, you can have sandstorms and you can have uh, also some uh, abrasion issues, but it's a very simple, simple and reliable technology PV. Yeah? So for me, I would say PV at, uh, is presently one of the best uh, renewable uh, technology. Thank you. What will happen when all cars are EV, all charging at the same time? What will be the price of electricity? A volunteer for that? Sure. I think I will take it up. The Abilash here. So I think I answered this uh, in a fairly broad sense in the uh, in the presentation anyway. But you know, when all the cars start charging, right? So you are going to see peaking of load. So when do we charge the vehicle becomes a big question. And of course, the behavioral change is something that we uh, okay. you know we see changing as well along with the vehicle. But uh, what happens to the price of electricity? Uh, for now, it's going to remain, uh, for now it's free of course, but as we go forward, it's, uh, you know, the first transition of course, it's going to be similar to you, what you charge at home. And then the time of day and time of peak charging you know, or charges will come into effect. And when you see bulk, uh, you know, uh, I would say bulk charging also happening, you know, like let's say a charging station or an energy storage based charging station, those tariffs will be completely different from uh, you know what you see in the market right now. Okay, thank you. How will private consumers be able to join the flexibility market? Market speaking about storage. Daniel, this is for you. Well, the short answer is in this region, no, they won't. Not under the current tariff environment. I'm not aware of any country that has peaking tariffs for residential in the Middle East. Please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. No. No, you're All right. right. No, Unfortunately. You're right. What about hydrogen power? Will it be part of the renewable energy sources and to what extent? I can answer this briefly because uh, we heard uh, two days ago uh, an agreement happened between aqua power and air products to build 5 billion green hydrogen uh, power plant, uh, green hydrogen plant. And this give you indication about how much hydrogen power will be involved uh, in, in energy mix uh, in the future. 
But uh, to one extent, nothing th certain till now. Yeah, it's uh, Saudi Arabia had the lead, and they they do it very seriously, as uh, we have seen. But to what extent? Really, we don't know. Usually, area usually follow what happened in Europe. That's the fact, really. So if it's like succeeded in Europe, for certain, uh, our area will follow. Can, okay. can I just add you? a hydrogen, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's suitable for big systems. For very small systems, it will be difficult. I think for electric cars, for example, it will take a long time to, to get hydrogen in the cars because it's very complicated. But I agree for very big systems, it can make sense. Or for big trucks, for example, speaking of mobile objects. So uh, it means trucks, boats, maybe aircraft, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So this discussion has been there for more than 10 years now, you know, but I think there is good progress in the last two or three, you know, where, uh, you know, large scale vehicles are seeing a transition with hydrogen. Successful to be frank. Okay, next question. I would say we take another five minutes. In view of the uh, current COVID situation, uh, economics, what would be the impact on investments on new technologies or green technologies? Uh, I can give a brief comment uh, on this. Uh, for me, for me personally, uh, others, of, co of course, might not share my uh, my view. Nothing is certain. Uh, I, I want to give an example. Uh, a study published, I think, two months ago. It's it made by two Italian scientists. Uh, the the paper said that uh, you know uh, internal combustion engine cars produce uh, particulate matter, which is usually 2.5 or 10. It's, it's called PM 2.5 or PM 10. So the study finds that this part, you can consider particulate matter as very fine dust. The study finds that this particulate matter can host COVID-19 virus. And this can be, among others, uh, the real explanation why uh, Corona uh, spread out in Lombardy area, in, in this area. And two days ago, uh, whole World, World Health Organization said uh, that virus can be airborne. So I think things like this, if proven true, will accelerate uh, transition. For example, for immobility, it will be, of course, at the end of internal combustion engine if this is, is if this uh, proven to be true. So for me, it's nothing certain, but my general overview, I think it will uh, accelerate our transition to cleaner and greener technology. I agree. Right. Thank you. Yeah, what, one more point of view is, you know, what we've seen in real time is that no project is actually canceled. You know, so uh, they are just delayed a little bit, you know, only because of the capital uh, investments. But when you look at uh, the technology itself, in the last in the in the last three months when COVID was not there, whoever's invested in solar technology or any other green technology you know, has been, uh, you know, so basically they didn't have to pay much in terms of electricity. In fact, literally zero. In fact, in some cases they have seen that, you know, the government has to pay them more because there is no load in any of their uh, buildings and solar keeps generating more. So whoever has benefited from net meters, you know, so they are going to go ahead with more projects is what I see. So it's again accelerating the push to green technologies. Thank you. Could we suggest some ideas for inventions in the field of renewable energy and discuss in a webinar next time? I could take this question. Uh, Mahmoud, please uh, feel free to contact me and definitely we can think about uh, an idea for the next webinar. No problem. Perfect. So let's take the last question. Saudi Arabia is currently the largest oil producer country in the world. What is their current situation with adapting grid flexibility to the yeah, to the grid? Daniel, do you have insights on that? Yeah, I think it's called a gas-fired power plant. Um, <laughs> that's the current approach of the Saudi Arabian grid regulator for grid flexibility. Um, so I haven't seen any storage uh, like being discussed for Saudi at all at the moment. Okay, okay. answer the question. We have four more questions. I don't know if we uh, have enough time to take them or not. Yeah, I unfortunately have to leave. Uh, I have another commitment uh, now. 
Um, but I want to thank uh, all of the speakers and uh, and the moderators for their contribution, and of course the audience for for listening. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye bye. And maybe if you have how many four remaining questions? Yes. Right. Okay, so let's try to finish that. I think it's very fair, and as long as the people are really interested in uh, getting the answers, uh, let's continue and finish that, because otherwise maybe we have to postpone and um, catch up later on. So yes. the next question is uh, this one. Yes, how or what could accelerate the transition from consumer to prosumer in the Middle East? I, okay, go, up, go Abilash, go. Okay, so... Uh, uh, you know, I think the tariff structure, you know, the change in the tariff structure and, of course, the time of day implementation, uh, you know, and, of course, I would also add, like to add the utilization and the power factor into the mix because that's also something based on the uh, policy itself. So that is what will accelerate the, uh, you know, the, I mean, the transition in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one. Do you think that speeding implementation is a leadership issue rather than a technical circumstances? Hmm. A tricky question. Okay. So I, I think I'll try, I try a swing at that. Uh, it's a mix of both. So I would say 50-50 at this point because uh, the technology is growing at a much rapid pace. And of course, the leadership needs to know all these technologies to evaluate that further. So I, an example I would give you, there are microgrid technologies, you know, starting from large to smaller household systems, which can actually uh, uh, be used to increase that penetration that you're talking about. But in many parts of the world, uh, you know, they are independent solutions, you know, like what Ali was mentioning uh, in uh, Africa. So people have made uh, technology on their own, right? So those are uh, systems, even companies like Hager and uh, uh, you know, the, the giants of the world, right? So they have technologies which actually can make that happen. But technology, the knowledge of technology takes time to reach the common uh, consumers. Uh, and of course, the leadership needs to know those to make those decisions. So it's still a 50-50 matter. Thank you. Next one, please. Oh, Eva? Okay. We have the next one. Any, any Hello? Hello? Um, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just trying to publish the next questions. Um, okay, I think I have a technical issue with the webinar here. Yeah. I can read it, I can read it for you. We have a comment for cool plants to phase out in the Middle East private companies should be allowed to develop renewable energy projects on a commercial level, not only residential level. Do you have any comments on this? I think, I think in the area, sorry, in the area, most of power generation is made by gas. So for coal power plant, even in Egypt, we had thoughts about to, to build coal power plants, but it's, it's, it's canceled and uh, substituted by renewable energy project. So, and I think in the area it's, it's moving, uh, renewable energy projects are very, very uh, dynamic. It's moving uh, towards build more and more renewable energy projects. Uh, that's, that's my comments. Well, I assume it's answering the question or, or further comments from Abila? Yes. Um, uh, okay, so, so I, it's not like, okay, coal power plants also had a have play a, a small role at this point. Okay, so currently, if uh, a, 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 I would say a community is uh, is completely dependent on the on these coal, coal on these coal power plants, you know, then they would definitely go for that. But you know, facing them out completely uh, is not just a private company matter, but also the public intent as well. So that's the uh, point I wanted to share. Okay, thank you. Okay. So our last question today, will there be a big change and large investment required in the infrastructure for electric charging stations? As worldwide, a lot of investment has already been done for petrol stations. Will everyone be ready to lose this investment and restart an investment on electric charging stations newly now? Uh, 
Okay, I will give my my comment on this. In Gulf area, yes, the economy depends heavily on electric charging, on uh, oil. It's, it's oil-based economy. And switching to electric charging and cars, electric cars, it's a huge step. But it must be done and it will be done. I remember at the beginning of renewable energy, uh, Gulf countries resist to tra this transition to renewable energy because, of course, they have cheap or cheap oil cheap gas and they resist this transition and, and proven situation but currently they are the leader in this area in, in, in renewable energy and we, you have seen huge uh, renewable energy projects so yes they will they will they will switch to electric station and they will I think in my opinion what they should done they should invest in battery technology they should build uh battery technology but, uh, battery uh factories because it's it, it's high demand uh, expectation it will be in, in very very uh people will demand uh battery storage either for residential solution or for grid solution or for cars so i think they switch and they should switch and invest in this and mm. uh, another one more perspective Sorry, sorry about that. So uh, I'll just start with it. So the, of course, uh, you know, the oil industry has taken about 100 years to reach where it is right now. You know, whereas the electric journey has just started. So, I mean, I wouldn't say started. We've been there for eight years now. But, you know, you will see that slow transition into the charging stations. So the infrastructure is not going to change. So only the technology used in that is going to change. So just like how you have, uh, you know, petrol pumps with the large tanks to store the petrol. You might have energy storage with charging stations in the similar fashion. And of course, just like how you have petrol station operators, you're gonna have charge point operators. So the uh, business model is already there, just that the technology shift is, or the transition is happening slowly, that's it. So it's not gonna be a complete, uh, you know, complete washout of the investment, but the infrastructure is gonna be uh, you know, similar and uh, that, I mean, that's going to be some co-sharing as well. Okay, uh, one more last question. I can I just add a comment uh, yes. on this? Of course. I, of course. I, think, I think that the market will decide what happens. And uh, during the COVID, the only uh, car manufacturer that didn't decrease was Tesla. Uh, we see in Europe a lot of people uh, stopping buying diesel engines. So I think at the end, uh, this, the big oil companies will have to adapt their distribution. And if there are more uh, electric cars in the market, they will have to deploy. They will have to adapt. It's a question of hen and egg. If there are more electric cars, they will, we, you will need more charging solutions for these cars. And we are in contact with big oil companies, uh, such as BP, Shell or others, and they are actively working on electrifying their uh, energy distribution system. Yes. In fact, it's already started in this part of the world. So to give you. One remark from my side, uh, if you have hydrogen, the complete infrastructure of the fuel stations now could be used in the future as well. So right. last and really last question now. Yes, with battery storage increasing exp uh, Expansionally, what would be the impact on the environment in terms of recycling of batteries and mining of raw materials? Oh, especially okay. batteries. Uh, okay, uh, for recycling batteries, yes, uh, there will be recycling. For example, let's take e-mobility as an example. We consider end of lifetime for battery for electric EV, EV when it reach eighty percent of its. Uh, initial capacity. After this, battery is taken off and it's disassembled. Every cell is checked and they are used in uh, in less dynamic environment like grid storage or uh, residential storage. So for e-mobility, yeah, it's, it's recycled. Uh, currently, there are a lot of it's hot topic for research to recycle even uh, dead battery, complete dead battery. It's, 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 uh, it's hot topic for research. And for mining, yes, we have because of we are using cobalt to its chemistry thing in the battery. We are using co cobalt heavily to to enhance uh, the characteristic and properties of batteries. And cobalt is mining mainly the main producer is Congo. And yeah, we have ethical issues there. We have a lot of concerns, 
but with with also research and technology we are getting out we are developing a lot of other technologies that is very promising like lithium air battery and 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 other technology so we are working yeah researchers uh, companies are working heavily on this topic to, to yeah to get advanced in this area right so yes, adding to that the amount of yeah. cobalt is sorry. decreasing huh? uh, sorry so, say it again the cobalt in battery is decreasing yes yeah. yes the amount of cobalt in batteries is decreasing even disappearing and we know that the next step will be a uh, solid state uh, lithium ion batteries so this is improving and improving and uh, i think also that the recycling industry has as you said ali there is a big potential for for improvement and also a big field uh, for for business for for these companies mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so when laptops started this was a major problem but now you do have a certain level of uh, you know recycling for those batteries and it's just propagated and electric mobility will add more focus on that research as well and if you take a battery the actual life of that battery including the second life is about 25 to 30 years so uh, you don't have to think about uh, you know recycling for the next 30 years so, I mean, depending on what type of battery chemistry it is thank you for the final words we close for today. No further questions, please. And uh, I hand over to the final words from uh, our side to Heba. Thank you so much. It was amazing discussion. Personally, I lear learned a lot. I had a lot of takeaways and I hope also for the attendees. Please uh, feel free to um, take a one minute survey right after this webinar. Tell us your feedback and uh, visit also our uh, website to learn more about the next and upcoming webinars. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for our valuable speakers, and I wish you a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.